Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan, and it's getting to be that time of year. A very spooky time of year. Are you scared? No? You probably should be. The reason Alex isn't on this episode? He's a ghost now! Yeah, I bet you didn't know that. We'll have to ask him about that the next time he's here. Anyway, I am joined by somebody else who has a, a few things going on that might seem a little bit spooky, but don't worry, we're going to get through it together. Dustin DePenning is back on the show. Dustin, thank you for joining me again. Hey, it's a pleasure to be back. Yes, uh, the last time we talked was about, actually, a, about a year and a half ago, I think, uh, when you came on to talk about uh, Heroic Dark in sort of its early release stages before it uh, went out to any kind of general population. I think that's where you were at at that time. Right, I uh, was just getting ready to release the free early edition, and then uh, in the year and a half since then, I've made some adjustments to the rules that have been pushed to drive through RPG for people to download. And then um, I'm currently working on a deluxe version that has some cool content and rule systems not included in the free version. Oh, very nice. Well, you can always tell that it's better because it has deluxe in it. When you put deluxe on yep. something. Yeah, you can always, that's always better. What, what are some of the things that you put into the deluxe version, if I might ask? So the game is about making your own game settings. There's like a world building mini game that the players and GM do together in the first session. Mm -hmm. But, you know, some people are, have a hard time coming up with their own settings or they're not sure, like, you know, what they can do with the system necessarily. So there's going to be a minimum of three uh, mini settings with uh, explanation of how the game works and like what the storyline is for that game setting. There's going to be three of those in there. There's going to be more equipment and rule examples to kind of help explain things better. And then um, there are modified NPC creation rules to give the GM more flexibility with the kind of challenges they want to throw at the players. And then uh, there's two new subsystems to increase crises and danger. And it's uh, the nemesis system where the GM can make like a particular character like really screw over the players. And then Perfect. there is yeah. there's the catastrophe, the catastrophe system where uh, usually the game is more sandboxy, where you have like a variety of zones you can go to to try to fight the darkness. Mm. When a catastrophe gets triggered, it's a you have to go address it immediately. You can't just get around to it when you want to. And then uh, if you don't address it, bad things happen. Oh, okay, okay. So it's sort of like, if I was equating to this to something I'm familiar with, in like XCOM, uh, occasionally you end up with like that thing where there's like a red alert and you have to deal with it inside of two turns because if you don't, you're you're going to lose entire like regions of the map. You're not going to be able to right. get those back. Okay, so it's it's sort of in that vein. I normally can go everywhere, but right now, you, this is an emergency, so you got to take care of this now. Exactly. Okay. Uh, I don't really want those, right? You don't want those to happen, and then when they happen, you, you got to deal with them or else it gets bad. Like, uh, from what you're describing, I'm hearing a lot of things that I don't want to happen in the deluxe edition. <laughs> <laughs> like there's it feels like there's a lot of like oh escalations and <laughs> and all sorts of of problems that I'm going to have to deal with. Why why do you hate me? <laughs> I don't... <laughs> the whole point is to make the game uh flexible and reactive enough to make things interesting. It's to help the GM know when to prod the players and when to give the players something to focus on so that way things don't get boring. You know, it's just trying to up up the level of engagement right were, were you finding because i've imagined that you've play tested this a bit with some people that if you have it as open-ended as the normal rule sets allow that it just kind of gets uh, it can get a little bit meandering like sometimes i imagine players if you give them 50 different options there's almost choice paralysis as to where you're going to go and what you're going to do was that kind of the reason why you had put in those additional rules yeah, a little bit. Uh, the main reason I put it in is 
there didn't seem to be enough opportunities where the players felt directly assaulted. Uh. Like, for the most part, uh, the bad guys are assaulting the game world, and then the players take the initiative of where they want to go to deal with that and help save the world. Gotcha. And they, they, there, there wasn't as much where the players felt directly prodded by the bad guys, mm. you know, to kind of keep them invested. So that's why I added those new subsystems. I see. That's good. Well, at least you were kind of reacting to what you were getting as feedback. How much playtesting had gone into Heroic Dark? Uh, up to the point where you were able to do the deluxe edition. So about another eight months of playtesting from the free version release last year. And then after that, it's just been, for the most part, just cranking on the the new setting that I want to launch for the game as well for people who want like a fully developed experience. So this is why we haven't really heard from you recently. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That in my day job, you know. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Last time that we talked, uh, and we were we were going over heroic dark and fighting the darkness and everything like that. Um, I did like the idea of kind of taking that notion of, of fighting the darkness and then just kind of having that as a, almost a decentralized uh, narrative, so that I could just build out my own kind of almost dark fantasy thing. I was actually kind of imagining. Um, never-ending story in a lot of ways when you were talking about it, because again, you're kind of talk fighting the darkness in that scenario. And I suppose I could do that, right? In a, in a heroic dark, if I just yeah, totally. I wanted to be a, a Treyu, and but um, I do want to talk about the new Kickstarter that you have. Is it going on right now? I believe it's already started. Yeah, yeah, almost fifty percent funded. Trying to get there. Yeah, uh, just just entered. Uh, as of today, we are in the second week of funding, so it would be awesome if we could break 50% this week. Yeah. Uh, so that's what, that's what I'm hoping for, so that if we break 50% this week, it increases the chances that we can hit some of our stretch goals. Oh, yes. So. And so that Kickstarter is indeed the, the setting, the fully fleshed out setting for Heroic Dark, right? It's Death Divers. Yes, it's Death Divers, and then it also, as part of the campaign, it includes the deluxe version of Heroic Dark as well, so you get both. Gotcha. Because the, to the two together are like a really good amount of content, like a good value for content. Mm. Heroic D Dark on its own is like 130 small pages, you know? It would be much sure. less than that if it was a full 8.5 by 11 book. Mm. And then uh, the setting is panning out to be around the same length, about 130 small pages. Oh, wow. So to, to, the two together are like a pretty good full-fledged uh, RPG experience. Gotcha. So that's why I'm doing them as a one Kickstarter. Okay. Well, that's good. Well, that's good because then, like we were talking about just a second ago, and, and it, the last time you were on, Heroic Dark being a decentralized system, and then also having one specific setting involved, you can get into it with the setting. And then afterward, you want to explore the system itself, you have that available as well. So that right, makes... exactly. Yeah, okay, that's great. That makes perfect sense. So the thing that we didn't get to talk about last time, because it was completely new to me when you told me about it, was indeed the Death Diver setting. Now, uh, you're going to have to explain a few things to me about this. Because, one, uh, the cover art, uh, immediately, like, I'm like, yes, good. Uh, and then when you say, inspired by the Expanse and Doom, Immediately, when I saw that uh, cover art, I was thinking Doom. That automatically looks like Doom to me, with the guy and, and with the gun, like, over the demons and the demon and shooting down at them. I was like, this looks reminiscent of a thing. When it comes to the Doom inspiration, I want to just take these in both parts, but when it comes to the Doom inspiration, besides the very cool uh, cover art that you have here, what other things in the setting would remind people of Doom? Probably just the, the central conflict. The central conflict is that demons from another universe are invading the solar system mm -hmm. and uh, attacking humanity in, in its many colonies. And uh, you play as uh, heroic private military marines who rip and tear until it's done. Oh, I see what you did there. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I know what soundtrack we can use while we're playing. <laughs> That's good to know. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. element that makes it a little more like the expanse is 
Uh, there is some political and economic tension across the solar system. Mm. The governments, the governments of Earth and Mars, don't take the demon threat seriously and haven't officially recognized it yet. Uh, so uh, it's vigilantes that are go- vigilantes that are going out and dealing with this. Mm. And then uh, there's also some elements of uh, intrigue as well because uh, the demons aren't always obvious with the way they attack. So sometimes. The players have to do some investigation and some discovery to root out demon presence and figure out what they're up to. Okay, yeah. Um, the Expanse is probably the thing that I'm not as familiar with. I, I never saw the series. I guess it's on my backlog to watch. Everyone told me great things about it, but I never got around to actually watching it. <laughs> the Expanse is like intermediate space sci-fi it's like a level of space sci-fi where humanity has settled the solar system Mm -hmm. but hasn't done it hasn't done interstellar travel yet and it's the same in death divers like you're confined to the solar system you can't go to other stars yet i see okay well that's actually kind of nice it feels a little bit when you get into like larger universal settings i think sometimes it can feel a little bit too sparse and too open uh, having it a, a little bit more closed off is actually helpful. In the initial thing, it says Demons and Carbines, TTRPG inspired. Demons and Carbines, first time I had ever heard of that. Is, is that a thing that I was not aware of? It's, uh, it's a thing I invented to, okay. try to, describe, to try to describe demon-killing military fiction, you know, which is a genre. Demon-killing military fiction is a thing. It comes up tons of times in short stories and animation shorts and video games and stuff like that. But, you know, saying the game is like demon military fiction didn't sound as fun to me. So I said right. demons and carbines. Demons and carbines. That's good. Getting into the actual setting, getting into the actual playtime. When it comes to my character, uh, what are some of the options that I have when I get into character design and creation? The basic uh, character archetype that you can start with is a retired death diver. This is a private military marine who professionally fought demons. And uh, the reason death divers exist is because in the other dimension where the demons are invading from, Mm -hmm. there is very valuable rare metals that are like essential to modern human technology. Mm -hmm. So they're always sending uh, mining excursions into that demon dimension to gather this metal. And then they pay uh, people from around the solar system to sign up and become soldiers to protect these operations. So those soldiers are really well paid, but have a really high mortality rate. So as soon as they get rich enough, they retire because they don't want to keep, you know, rolling the dice with their life. So that's one type of character you can be is, you know, you fought demons for pay a long time ago, but in the demon dimension itself where they mine for the rare metal. And then uh, now that the demons are invading our solar system and I found a way into our dimension. Now you're like, oh, the the fight's been brought home. So I got to come out of retirement and uh, take this on. Uh So that's uh, that's one type of character you can be. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can also be like a uh, social exile from uh, different areas of society. Like you could be from uh, Mars. Mars is ultra capitalist. It's basically like a uh, planet built by Amazon and Jeff Bezos, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. So uh, there's a lot about money, but there's also corruption. And then when people get caught, uh, committing too many crimes or being too corrupt, they'll you know they'll be forced out of society. So maybe you were on the wrong side of the law or something at Mars, mm. or uh, or you could be manual laborers across the solar system. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of uh, automation and robots and AIs, but there are certain companies out there that are purposely hiring humans as like a jobs program. Like they get kickbacks from Earth <laughs> if they hire humans. Yeah. Yeah, you might be a, uh, I think it's called a moonhead is one of them, where you were hired to uh, help disassemble and take apart uh, machines on the moon to reclaim the scrap and build new spaceships. Like, that might be a spot Uh you're from. Or you could be from one of the low-gravity colonies across the solar system, because there's really no habitable world as big as Earth. So 
you know, all the other colonies are low gravity. That's kind of one of the er other areas where it's similar to the Expanse, where you might be affected by the low gravity. It's not as harsh as the Expanse. It's assumed that all player characters uh, sufficiently developed that they can handle Earth gravity if they want. Mm -hmm. Because that's something in the Expanse that, like, people who grow up in the asteroids, like, can't survive on Earth because their bodies just can't handle it. So it's uh, it's not that extreme, but it is... uh, you know, you are different. You're taller, lankier, skinnier, weirder. Mm. You know, when you grow up, grow up in low gravity. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's just a you know a lot of different colonies and different nooks and crannies you can be from, and there's sure. definitely a lot of pr- a lot of crime. So that I'd say the the two the two biggest uh, the two biggest uh, groups that you could probably be from as a independent vigilante is a retired death diver or a uh, reformed criminal of some kind okay okay yeah or uh, i end up having to get off of uh mars because i didn't sign up for like barsoom prime or whatever they they're selling to me over there um, <laughs> yep <laughs> okay. yeah when it comes to earth in this setting um what what does earth really look like at this point so earth is an ecological disaster covered with floating mega cities and unemployment mm-hmm. is ridiculously high because there's just no work for people to do because automation has taken over almost everything. No, I mean in the game. What is it? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> 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 no, but I can I can imagine this world you're talking about. So I'm get okay, so most people are looking for opportunities elsewhere then. Yeah, and that's the reason why the Death Divers have such an easy time recruiting, because there's billions of people on Earth who are just looking for a way to make money. Um, Very few people on Earth starve, and very few people on Earth are homeless, Mm. uh, but they live in horrible, cramped quarters that are not glamorous and eat crappy food, and it's just a really depressing life. Uh, There's a whole class of people called Ubies, which is based off of the acronym UBI for Universal Basic Income. That's uh, just a huge swath of the population that the only money they have access to is the money they get for simply being alive that Earth provides provides them. And the only reason Earth does this is Earth is making quadrillions of dollars a year in industry, but it's just so few people are producing that money because there's so little work that they just, you know, take the taxes and then pay this, like, pittance living stipend to everybody else on Earth who isn't good enough to get a job. Right. So then the people who want to make it rich and want to improve their life, they're tempted to join this crazy private military outfit where you go fight demons and have a high chance of dying because you're going to get way more money and it's going to get you out of the slums of Earth. Right. There is the, of course, downside that you now have to fight demons. So, right. Yeah. But I mean, I guess that's why you're getting paid because hazard pay. Exactly. Yeah. Your your retirement plan has to be very enticing for me to get out there <laughs> to do that. Yeah. Well, it's just it's just uh people are so desperate that they're just looking for any opportunity to make something of themselves. Sure. And uh let me crack open the book real quick. There's an introduction that has some fun statistics in it cuz I wrote down the like survival statistics of death divers and stuff like that oh good i'm glad you thought of that (laughs) here it is they only have a 60 percent chance of surviving their first mission (laughs) so it's like it's a really it's a really challenging job yeah yeah. and then even if you're like a genius even if you're a genius at the job and you're really good at it the highest your survival chance goes up to is 90 percent. so like you always have a one in ten chance of just biting it Right. Uh, right. You know, fighting these demons. Yeah. What are these demons like? Can you can you conceptualize for me what the demons are are like so that I kind of have a picture of them? Yeah, so they uh they come in all shapes and sizes mm-hmm. and uh different forms, but in general they are kind of like that doom demon, you know, red skin, creepy muscles and skin everywhere mm-hmm. and you know, horns, eyeballs, and teeth, and stuff like that. And yeah. uh, they're all, they're different intelligence levels. Like, some are much smarter than others. Uh, they're different sizes. 
some are like over 12 feet tall you know Mm -hmm. uh they're different they're different uh organism types like a lot of them are humanoid but some of them are like insectoid or bestial and things like that and uh they uh each different type of demon has different things that it's good at so like there might be like you know a wispy thin demon that can almost turn invisible or disguise itself or there might be a uh giant insectoid demon that can infect your brain and mind control you you know like oh uh then there's little little imp demons that uh somehow psychically learn how to talk to humans and actually tempt them and make deals with them you know and mm. uh and then the Fine. biggest threat honestly the biggest threat honestly is uh a class of demon called an engineer and the the situation is when humans first discovered this other universe and then first discovered the demons the demons were like basically in the stone age or just like savages with nothing going on. Mm. But uh, the longer humanity was investigating the demons dimension and fighting the demons and accidentally leaving things behind, uh, the demons started reverse engineering the technology and the demons are getting smarter and better and having better technology to the point now where demons have actually made spaceships at, for like the first time ever oh no Uh, they're nowhere yeah they're nowhere near as great as human spaceships are but you know they still they they're they can take to the stars now which they couldn't do before yeah no well uh, you know even a bad spaceship is still a spaceship it gets you (laughs) it gets you places so you don't want demons to have that ability before they had those uh, ships were they confined to one of the planets well it's uh the way they got into our solar system is twofold one is they're in a totally separate dimension and they did not have the means to uh teleport between the divide of the two universes so they couldn't just like come into our universe only we had the technology to go to theirs they did not have the technology to come to ours and then they also didn't they also didn't have like you know flying vehicles or spaceships of any kind uh but then what what ended up happening was um a a group of scientists got too big for their britches and tried to develop a uh, better dimension piercing technology Mm. because this dimension this dimension piercing is how you travel fast in the universe because when you uh pierce the barrier between our universe and the demon universe uh, you end up moving way faster as a point of reference to our universe. So, like, if you're going, you know, like Mach, you know, Mach twenty or Mach thirty or whatever in the Demon universe, yeah. whenever you decide to pierce the veil again and pop back out into humanity, mm. into the humans universe, the point of reference it's as if you were traveling like Mach thirty thousand or Mach oh. forty thousand. So it's that's kind of how humans get around. Not only do they mine for that precious metal, they also travel through the demon dimension just to move quickly and get around the solar system faster. But uh, the scientists tried to figure out if they could pierce again, like keep going down the chain of uh, like geometry to, to increase the speed multiplier. Mm-hmm. So they're like, OK, if we pierce down to the demon dimension, we go like a thousand times faster What if we pierce down to the dimension below that? And that's what they tried to do. But um, uh, instead, the experiment failed and then ripped a permanent hole between our universe and the demon universe. And now that the demons have aircraft and spaceships, they can just spill out of that hole into our solar system. Yeah. These things never seem to work out quite the way they were hoping. Oh, never. No, it really hubris. Oh, my goodness. It's always hubris. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm looking for one day having a sci-fi story where uh people tried to do something and it went off perfectly. It just it, it <laughs> nothing went wrong, everything went fine and we're very happy with the results. That's all I'm looking for. I don't I don't know if they've ever gotten there. It feels like every That's, time I turn around. I, and, yeah. That it, it, it sounds pretty boring, actually. <laughs> it really, it really does. But I just, I just would like to know if someone somewhere <laughs> figured out how to do it effectively. It would be more. That's uh, like, yeah. 
it's like a it's like a horror movie where the victims are smart enough to just get out of there yeah (laughs) yeah yeah yeah, exactly it's just your uh, okay here's your ghost house and people just kind of go you know what i'm just not gonna go into the ghost house (laughs) i'm just not going in (laughs) and they just walk away and the ghost is just left there (laughs) and no one ever touches it it's um yeah no it's boring but i feel like it's more um, an educational reference point than anything else for for future yeah. generations. You know, just the like, oh, okay, right. here's here's a here's a framework for you. It says in your Kickstarter that uh, there are nine different setting locations. So I'm a little familiar with Earth and the Moon and Mars. We talked about uh, some of the you know, moons of of uh, Jupiter and everything. Um, then I see a few where I'm like, okay. No idea what those are. So, uh, Void Scepter, what is that? Void Scepter is a space station on the edge of the solar system. Mm. And it's where they're trying to develop interstellar travel. And that's where they accidentally ripped open that permanent hole between our universe and the demon universe. Mm. Okay, okay. So, So that was the troublemaker. Planet X... Planet X is the 10th planet in the solar system. Mm. Right now, there is a theoretical ninth planet that uh, astronomers are looking for that they see evidence of, and they think it might be a gas giant. Mm. And then I just thought it'd be fun to make up a 10th planet that's actually, uh, you know, a normal terrestrial style world where it's, you know, rocky and soil and, you know, have uh, different types of uh, minerals and metals on it and stuff. And uh, that is the furthest out human settlement that has been terraformed. I see. I see. It would be interesting if uh, you had like a planet X, but it was actually just Pluto in disguise trying to get back into the solar system. <laughs> and it's like, no, no, really, guys. No, it, no, it's fine. No, I just I added a little bit of mass. We're good. I'm on planet again. It's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, oh, poor Pluto. And um, finally, what is the Maw? The Maw is that hole between our universe and theirs. Okay. Oh, and I can go there? Yes. I don't want to, though. <laughs> you might have to, to fight the, to fight the demons oh. and keep them from causing problems. Is this one of those things where there might be an emergency that I have to go and take care of immediately? Exactly. Oh, okay. Not particularly looking forward to that, but I, I understand why it's there now. Looking at like stats, how I'm actually playing, what does a, a typical mission look like inside of Death Divers? So the, uh, the GM is supposed to think of a general crisis that uh, is going on, like something that the darkness is doing to advance its goals. Mm-hmm. And uh, in the Death Divers book, there are 27 uh, crisis ideas where basically it's like a few paragraphs with some character ideas explaining like, here's the problem that the players have to solve. Mm. And that's basically three crises per location in the game, because there's nine locations and you have three crises per location. So that's 27 crises. Mm. And uh, so the GM picks that up and then the GM outlines some loose benchmarks called objectives that are like if the players manage to achieve this you know then that helps in the fight against the darkness if they don't achieve this then that hurts in the fight against the darkness Mm. and uh the players play and it's kind of more open-ended where the players get to figure out what their solutions are to the problems the gm presents them you know the gm is supposed to plan solutions to make sure that they are solvable Mm-hmm. But you're not supposed to you're not supposed to make it linear where there's certain things the players have to do or else they fail. Like the stuff the GM plans, uh, the rules are such a way where if you're doing the thing the GM intended you to do, it's always hard. It's possible, but it's hard. Mm. And then if you if you find the clever solution, it might be way easier uh, to do it the clever way because you might sidestep a lot of the challenges that the GM has put in the way of you kind of rewards player creativity and thinking ahead basically at the end of the session you look at everything the players managed to achieve and everything they achieved increases the health score of that location so each of the nine locations has a score from zero to eight that tells you 
how healthy they, they are in resisting the demons. That score goes up uh, whenever the players do a mission there and then achieve these objectives. It's probably a good time to talk a little bit about, because uh, it's been a little while since we talked about Heroic Dark as a setting in general, but can you just give me a little bit of an overview of the, the dice pool system so we can uh, reiterate how that works? Because it works on a D6 system, correct? Right. Uh, D6 dice pool, and it's pretty brutal. Only mm-hmm. sixes are a success. Yeah, right. Yeah. At any time you take an action, you get to roll five D6. And you're looking for a single six to get a uh, one success. But the difficulties can range from one uh, to four. Most things are one to four. And then things that are like that you just want to try because you want to do something crazy. You know, things that are almost theoretically impossible can be as high as eight. So it's like somehow you're going to have to come up with eight sixes out of five decks. And there are ways to do that using special abilities and stuff. So yeah, you roll the five dice and you, you keep the sixes and those are the successes and you have to meet or exceed the difficulty of the task in order to win. You have attribute scores that range from zero to five mm-hmm. and that determines how many failed dice you get to re-roll. So you, from, as far as dice go, you never earn more than five successes but you might get a higher chance of getting more successes because you get to re-roll the failed dice that didn't come up six. Gotcha. And then you have all of these different resources at your disposal as a character that you can burn through to get extra successes automatically. And that's how you get all the way up to like eight successes is by burning these resources. And uh, when you run out of these resources, you start taking injuries. So Mm -hmm. it's kind of like a, it's an attrition game of like knowing how far to push yourself when the moment needs it. So you don't end up paying for it later. Like between these two, this is a pretty big collection between these two books. You're looking at the Heroic Dark Deluxe rulebook being, you're saying like 140 pages? Yeah. Okay. And, um, but that's like, that's like eight eight by five size, you know, like a small, a smaller book. Sure, 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 sure. Uh, and then uh, about the same amount of content at, for the setting itself. Yeah, about another 140 pages for the setting. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot uh, for people to dive into. Oh, uh, <laughs> I made it funny because it's called Death Divers. I didn't even think about that. Nice. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, that's synergy right there, folks. When did you actually start working on Death Divers as a setting? About May last year when I launched the free edition. Oh, okay. Okay. When you're talking about, like, playtesting, were you pretty much playtesting with Death Divers as a setting to figure out Heroic Dark? Yeah, so I had, the year before I released the free version, I ran Heroic Dark campaigns to playtest in various, you know, shorter campaigns, you know, only a few sessions here or there to, you know, try out these different things. And then I wanted to do uh, a much longer term campaign to really nail out the overarching story mechanics. Mm -hmm. And so when I released the game in May, I uh, found a local group here in Los Angeles to play with. And then our session zero, we came up with uh, a setting pretty similar to where Death Divers has ended up. So I used that setting we came up with in uh, in our world building session and added more details and fleshed it out and, you know, kind of patched up a few of the plot, the plot holes that we had, you yeah. know. And then that's what I was using to build the game setting. And then uh, I would use inspiration from, from our sessions we would run to fill content in the book. In your uh, opinion, when we're talking about, like, playing Death Divers or really Heroic Dark in general, what, what do you think it lends itself to better? Is it better at, for short campaigns, long campaigns, one-shots? Where do you think it falls into a sweet spot? Uh, me- Medium-length campaigns, usually less, than fi- usually less than 15 sessions. Okay. Is it sweet, is it sweet spot? Because the mechanics actually tell you when it ends. The mm. overarching story mm. mechanics tell you when everything is resolved and everything is over. And it, it just, and these mechanics that the players are trying to interact with and influence in their favor, these mechanics decide, do, do the bad guys win or do the good guys win? 
And then sure. that's when the campaign ends is, is when that decision is reached. I see. Okay. Okay. But that's okay. I think a 15 session game is perfectly fine. Sometimes uh, I find myself in campaigns that just keep kind of going on and on and, and don't need to. So 15 sessions. Yeah. Is, yeah. 15 sessions. If you're, if you're meeting weekly, that's, you know, four months. That's not bad. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good length of time. And then you just start, you start a new, you start a new scenario. Perfect. Exactly. Yeah. So this is good. If I was diving into this particular system, uh, I could just start with Death Divers because you already have the system already, you, uh, you have the setting already done. And then after that session, I could say, hey, let me just custom build something. I also have the ability to do that with Heroic Dark. So this is good. Yeah. Right. And the fun part, the fun part of custom building your own setting is doing it as a group with all the players at the table rather than the GM just homebrewing by themselves. Yes, and because uh, then everyone ever because then everyone has a fingerprint on the on the setting, and then everyone's invested and interested in what's going to happen next. Right, right. Now, uh, because of the general tone of the game and the fact that it is indeed called Death Divers, um, was it a intentional decision or just a happy accident that that this falls around Halloween? <laughs> Uh, happy accident caused by COVID. Right. Happy accident based on the actual heroic dark setting we're dealing with in the world today. Right. Yeah. The darkness we're fighting currently. The darkness we're actually fighting right now in the real world. It is the kind of thing, though, that normally if you said, well, yeah, it's, it's Death Divers and I fight demons in space. What time of year would you want to, you know, put that out on a Kickstarter? My initial thought is probably October. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> nice. That was normally the thought that I had. What are some of the pledge levels? What are some of the rewards people could get when they go to the Kickstarter? So the cheapest pledge level is the digital only, and that gets you. Uh, it's twenty dollars, and it gets you a uh, PDF of Death Divers and then a PDF of Heroic Dark Deluxe. So you get both books for twenty dollars. Mm-hmm. And then the the next tier up is the printed version, and it is thirty dollars to get both books printed. The reason it's so cheap, though, is uh, the way print on demand works at Drive Through RPG, because that's the method I'm using to deliver the books. The way print on demand at Drive Through RPG is is that uh, I, as the publisher, have to spend a certain amount of money to Drive Through RPG to get the book printed, and then I add uh, a margin on top of that that I then charge you guys. I see. And uh, what I'm doing for the Kickstarter is I'm only charging the margin, the $30 margin. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to get, you're going to get at cost coupons to buy the books from drive through. So that way, uh, that way, uh, you know, you pay for whatever, you know, the amount that it costs to just print the book. And then you also, you have to pay the shipping as well, which drive through has uh, distribution centers in Europe and the United States. So they have, some options if you're around the world to try to keep the shipping from being too expensive. Oh, good. The next tier up is the signature level, which is where I, uh, you have to pay the full price uh, markup and printing costs to me because I have to order it and send it to LA. And then myself and Alexis will sign the book and then we will uh, mail it directly to you. And we don't charge shipping in the United States for that pledge level. But we do charge uh, shipping worldwide outside the U.S. Sure. If you really like the book and uh, want our signatures in it, you back the signature level. And then the highest level is uh, design and NPC level. It's two hundred dollars, and you get the signed books. No shipping, and no shipping anywhere. Even if you're in, you know, Fiji, we won't charge you shipping for this pledge level. Uh, you work with us. You help come up with a cool NPC to throw at the mercy of the demons. Yeah, when you uh, you were mentioning that too, is you did have a couple other people that were working on your team for this game, didn't you? Yeah. So the main people are myself, Alexis Roy, who is an uh, author. She writes a lot of uh, books and uh, different types of fiction, and she really likes sci-fi and hasn't been able to do as much sci-fi as she wants to do. So she was excited to work on this project. And mm -hmm. so she and I have been collaborating on a lot of the setting material 
and because she's an author, she helps out with the wording and the editing and making sure it's not garbage, you know? <laughs> you sure. <laughs> and then uh, uh, the artist who's doing almost all of the artwork is Vla- is uh, Vladislav Orlovsky. And uh, he's an international guy who really likes making weird, twisted-looking creatures. So he's just perfect for this game. Oh, yeah. And then, yeah. <laughs> and then, um, and then for uh i needed additional writing help uh to come up with even more content so i brought on stephanie bryant who has made uh, a few games of her own like uh threadbare which is a game about toys that come to life during the apocalypse and oh, i like that uh, yeah. so <laughs> yeah i like that okay and uh, so she is helping write the mini settings that go with the heroic dark deluxe book and she's come up with some pretty crazy cool ideas that I'm really excited about. And then, uh, and then also uh, I'm working with Tobias Strauss who has uh, published some different games as well. He works more in the story game realm uh, like Stephanie Bryan as well. They, they like to do a lot of apocalypse world style games as they tend to publish, but they have lots of cool story ideas. They have lots of cool story ideas. And Tobias is really good at, uh, painting with a broad brush, which is exactly what I needed for these uh, uh, little NPC bios to fill up the book, to give you characters for the players to interact with. And what he'll do is he'll just write some like quotes that just immediately tell you what that NPC's personality is like. Mm -hmm. And then in a couple of paragraphs, you you feel like you know exactly who this NPC is. So Mm -hmm. he's been working on all the NPCs that go along with the mission outlines. Okay, excellent, excellent. Toys that come alive during the apocalypse. That that actually even lends itself a little bit to the, the time period, because then I start thinking about, like, zombie teddy bears, and now I'm scared. Of my, okay, I scared myself. All right, so, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> move, move, moving on. What are some of the stretch goals you'd like to achieve here? So I have a lot of content stretch goals to improve uh, the value of your dollar mm-hmm. in terms of what it costs to get the books. Mm-hmm. So at about every 2000 increment above the funding goal, uh, someone on the creative team is adding additional content. Mm-hmm. So it starts with me. It starts with me uh, making more demons for the bestiary. Right now, there's 31 demons that you can fight and try to kill. And then I might add another 10 to 20. Uh, at least 10 will be added for the first stretch goal just to kind of you know, have more threats to throw at the players. Uh, the next stretch goal at $10,000 is for Tobias to write another 15 NPCs just to have more story content and things for the, you know, nice things for the players to interact with instead of things that are trying to kill them. <laughs> sure. And then the next stretch goal after that is, yeah. <laughs> well, the next stretch goal after it, that it is... It feels I'd, just out of place. <laughs> you've, you've thrown all of these terrible things at me. Also... Let's just get some nice things in here. <laughs> we felt bad for you, but we've gotten to this tier level. So here's some nice characters that you can interact with. <laughs> you, yeah. You, you took pity on the players at a certain point. Yeah. yeah. And then um, the next stretch goal level is incre- it's, uh, a minimum of eight additional illustrations to increase the number of demons that get illustrated. So that way you can like really visualize what the players are fighting. You know, you can look at this like sweet, this sweet creature design and be excited. Yeah. Um, The stretch goal after that is uh, doing some more long form writing. So instead of doing these uh, awesome like snippet NPC bios, getting some uh, really like some main characters that have really long, complex stories. If you want to really flesh out the world. So that's uh, Alexis is going to write about seven long form NPCs just to kind of deepen the storyline sure. of this, of the world. And then at 16,000, uh, Stephanie is going to write uh, an additional two uh, mini settings to inspire you for your own heroic dark games. In addition to the three that have already been written, you know, another two. So that'll be five settings in the deluxe book instead of only three. Oh, nice. Very and nice. then, uh, the next is a jump all the way to 20,000, which is where Vladislav illustrates even more demons. So we can get, you know, try to approach getting almost half of the demons illustrated. So you have like a lot of good visual reference. 
Sure. And then um, Alexis Roy is going to write a uh, an actual narrative that will really uh, pad out the page count of the book and really give you like a frame of reference on what life is like in the Death Divers universe. Oh, good. Oh, good. The uh, frame of reference is always important. I want to know more about the setting that I'm diving into because chances are you're trying to kill me in it, and I'd like to be <laughs> I'd like to be aware of the entire lore of this world before you try to kill me in it, because I feel, Dustin, that you're trying to do that. <laughs> I, like, the, like, the overall tone is that you're trying to kill my character very quickly. In all honestness, this isn't like, a, this isn't like an OSR game where it's like, roll to not die. <laughs> right. You know, it's more along the lines of think to not die, that you just can't sleepwalk through the game and just spend your meta-narrative points to make good things happen. It's kind of a narrative game in the sense that it's flexible and it's open-ended and it, it enables you to tell lots of different types of stories and different genres. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's kind of old school, too, in the sense that if you're not engaging with the game and not trying to do a good job, you will die. <laughs> mm-hmm. Death is uncertain. It's not guaranteed. It's not like playing Dungeon Crawl Classics where you roll up eight characters because you know seven of them are going to die. Right. You know, but um still you know there's always that possibility that your character that you love that you've invested in might get caught at the wrong end of uh a demon's uh claws yeah fair enough the campaign though i'm just really excited about this i think it's it's going to be an awesome setting that has lots of material to help you run a great campaign in this setting and i just uh really you know i know a lot of people like to wait till the end to back but uh, the higher the higher your funding is when you get to the end, the more lift you get at the end. Right. So if you're thinking about backing, if you're thinking about backing back now, because then we're going to hit more of those stretch goals. Because, mm-hmm. you know, if we're if we're close to funding on the like last week, then we'll hit some of the stretch goals, you know, or if we fund now, like early on, then we're definitely going to hit a bunch of stretch goals sure that'll improve the quality of the product and that'll improve your value you'll get more for your dollar so you know if you and your friends are interested in this rather than wait to the end like i would say back now because it doesn't it's going to cost you the same either way and it's going to it's going to give you more product in the end right right there there are no real bonus points for like getting in at the last minute you, you there's nothing there's nothing extra that you're going if you get it in if if you back now uh then it it's more likely that you'll be able to hit more stretch goals and that's just going to improve the product when everybody gets it so something to consider exactly yeah yeah i know that it it does like one time they showed me like breakdowns of what kickstarters normally do and it's like a lot of the funding is either at the very very beginning or the very very end in the middle it's not so much and i kept thinking to myself okay a lot of early adopters and very late adopters but i don't really understand why people would wait so long to just see uh, until the very end i i never really understood that idea i don't understand things so i'm i'm a bad person to ask dustin If folks wanted to learn more information about Heroic Dark, about uh, Death Divers, or, I mean, hey, just about willpower games in general, where could they go on the internet? So you have a few options. Mm -hmm. You can follow me. You can follow me on Kickstarter and get alerts when I make posts there or launch a campaign there. That's Willpower Games. Willpower is two words, W I L L P O E P O W E R. Mm-hmm. And uh so Willpower Games on Kickstarter, you can follow me there. Uh you can also follow Willpower Games on Drive Through RPG. I tend to be more active on Drive Through RPG uh in terms of uh you know sending out uh newsletters about what's going on. So mm-hmm. that's uh, a good place to follow me and find out about new products I'm working on. And then um, you can follow me on Twitter, uh, depending Dustin, at depending Dustin. And I don't post on Twitter a whole lot, but I do go on there sometimes, especially when I'm running a Kickstarter like right now. Sure. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's another place you can follow me as well. Oh, good. Good, good. Uh, yeah. Uh, when it comes to us, we, we are also on things like Twitter, but you might not find us as active. <laughs> 
<laughs> as you might normally. Uh, mostly what we do there is uh, for, like, at Dell Podcast, we'll, uh, we'll tell you about everything that hits the website when it comes out. Uh, you can also, of course, follow me and Alex. I am at Citanium, and Alex is at EXP Limited. Um, and uh, for anything Delve-related, you can go to DelveCast.com. And while you're there, maybe you click on the Patreon banner. Why not? I dare you. I double dare you. If you say Patreon three times in a row, something happens. I don't know what. It might be something creepy. It's that time of year. Try it out. See what happens. I think... I think people would rather say OnlyFans three times in a row. <laughs> I, I have not launched that yet, Dustin. <laughs> Nor does anyone want me to. <laughs> I, I, next time we have a powwow with the, with the crew, I, I will tell them that that's going to be a new project. Oh, that's a good video I gotta make. The Delve Only Fan, <laughs> the Delve Only Fans page. Well, you asked for it, folks. Here we are. Um, but no, it's not. No one's gonna want that. Okay, so I. Am... So this has been terrific. Thank you so much for coming back on the show, Dustin. Telling me all about the the horrible things that are trying to kill me. It does seem like every time you're on, something is trying to kill me. I don't know why. I like grim settings with high stakes and where the players feel like they really got to fight for it. I think you're succeeding in that. <laughs> Cause without even picking it up yet, I'm already getting that. <laughs> I've already been getting that. Nice. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of which, uh, synths, are they still out to get me? Uh, only if you get in their way. Otherwise they couldn't give a shit about you. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you for joining us again. And, uh, hoping that Kickstarter goes well for you. Uh, looking forward to the next time you're on when you get to tell me about probably something else that's trying to kill me. I, I don't, I don't know what it's going to be. Look at, looking forward to what you have <laughs> planned for me next. Yep, it'll yeah. be a good time. It will definitely be a good time. <laughs> All right, and uh, thank you to everybody that joined us on this lovely episode at this spooky time of year. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you on the next episode. Bye, everybody. You have to be able to throw sixes a lot. This is a Yahtzee for geniuses. You need to, you need to <laughs> get sixes all the time.